because studies have shown that if you go from a place of accomplishment, of really setting your mind into a place of knowing that you have the ability to learn anything you put your mind to do, accomplish and achieve anything you truly want, then anytime you learn something new from that mindset, you're more capable of actually learning at a faster rate and doing a better job of, of connecting with that. Mm -hmm. So what I want you to do is imagine or recall a time in your life whenever you accomplished or achieved something that you were really, really proud of, something that was important to you. Um, that could be graduating from college, high school, can be finishing a race first, uh, baking a perfect birthday cake for somebody. Whatever it is, just connect with that and, and really go back to that moment. Imagine that you're there now. Mm. And wherever that, that feeling, whenever you connect with that, on a scale from one to 10, I want you to just see where that's at. You know, one being I barely feel it, 10 being I really feel it strong. Where, where would you say you're at? I would say that in general, I don't connect really well in the past to positive things. Okay. Um, I, I, it's really easy for me to feel or dwell on bad stuff that happened. You're not, you're not uncommon in that, yeah. in that area. That's, that's, what, that's why I, this exercise is so important. Hmm. Um, because a lot of times before people go into meetings even, yeah. they'll connect with the last time that they failed. Yeah. And what do you think that does to your posture, your demeanor, your oh, confidence? Sure. Whenever you walk into the meeting, everything goes out the window. Your shoulders are slumped forward. Yeah. You, you know, head down. You're like, nah, nah, nah. nobody wants to see that guy. But if you connect with the last time that you had a victory, a real win, mm -hmm. you know, something like that. So if you were forced and I had to put a gun to your head, tell me the last time that you felt like you were a champion, that you had a real victory. When is that? I mean, I just I felt really good yesterday, to be honest. Awesome. I had a number of good phone calls and just like felt really productive at the end of the day. Perfect. Uh, and felt like where I was set up for the rest of the week was in a good spot. And it's awesome. like it wasn't anything wild or huge that happened. It was just like, hey, did the things I wanted to do, felt yeah. really set up for success, uh, came home and, and uh, paused the television in the middle of it to say it to the wife, you know, that sort of thing. Man, that's yeah. awesome. Yeah, that's great. And so if you were to like focus on that moment right now and that feeling that you had, where would you say on a scale from one to 10, how much do you connect with that right now? I mean, because it was yesterday, that, that does make it a little bit easier. Sure. Uh, yeah, probably, yeah, seven or eight. Seven or eight. Because yeah, I guess when you say it like something uh, achieved, like important, like huge, yeah. it just feels like all of those are so much further further back in time. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And people always want to want to reach for something that really matters, yes. you know, kind of thing. But yeah. it doesn't need to be. I mean, like, that's why I even say when you bake somebody the perfect birthday cake mm -hmm. or something mm -hmm. like that, you know, mm -hmm. it doesn't have to be, it just whatever matters to you. If you had a moment that you just felt great about something, yeah, that's all that matters. So I want to connect with that. And uh, the reason, reason for that too is, um, I don't know if you've noticed, but it's really, really hard to be depressed whenever you're grateful, whenever you're considering a time whenever you overcame an mm -hmm. adversity, whenever you uh, connect with a moment in your life whenever you were on top. It's really, really difficult to be down. And so we want to go into learning anything new from a positive state of mind. So that's what I want to do every time we start something new. Um, tonight we're going to be learning uh, sensory acuity. This is neurolinguistic programming. Sensory acuity has three pillars, and we'll be going through these three pillars, three sections. Uh, the first one we're going to focus on is emotional intelligence. That's the seven basic human emotions. Anger, contempt, fear, disgust, happiness, sadness, and surprise. Um, have you ever seen the show Lie to Me? Yes. Okay. We watched. We tried to watch all of them. Okay. Perfect. We're so, probably the reason it went off air. <laughs> we right. didn't succeed. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so that was based on a real doctor, uh, mm -hmm. Dr. Paul Ekman. Uh, of course, in the show, it's Dr. Cal Lightman, uh, which is is a fictional character, and and a lot of what's on the show is is mm -hmm. overdone. It's it's a bit embellished. Yeah. Uh, but. Paul Ekman actually did spend time with the tribes in Papua New Guinea, and he discovered that every single uh, tribe, community, culture has these seven basic emotions. Mm -hmm. They're universally recognizable. We all know what they are. We all do them. The problem is that we do them at 1 25th of a second. Mm -hmm. And so if you're not really, really good at focusing in and knowing what it is you're looking for, you'll miss it. You'll miss what it is that that person is feeling or, or mainly feeling and, and thinking. And so whenever you tune up your sensory acuity, you get really, really good at being able to identify these in real time. And that does a lot for you being able to stay in rapport with somebody, being able to notice when you just said something and they all of a sudden they have like a twinge and, and you, you can know 
what that was. You won't know exactly what it was that caused that twinge, but you'll know what emotion they felt. And that's what matters. It's because you can say, did I say, did I say something to scare you? I, I didn't mean to, did, what, what, you had a fear there. What, 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 what is that? Can you, do you mind communicating that to me? And people will really, it'll, it'll, sometimes it'll come across like it's a sixth sense, but obviously it's just skills and training and watching what they're giving you, biofeedback. Is there um, any, any significance, when I look at that list of seven emotions, only one of them seems to be positive. <laughs> like the, the vast majority of them seem to be negative. Happiness and, and often surprise can be, okay. can be positive. Um, but yeah, anger, contempt, fear, disgust, and sadness are very, very primal. They seem to be uh, a, a very rapid, uh, that when we feel them, we react. So, so that's why there's, there's a seven basics. Okay. So, yeah. Um, and most of the time, if you're in a neutral state, which is pretty much what everybody kind of wants to be in, mm -hmm. contentment, mm -hmm. you, you're not really demonstrating any micro expressions. You're not showing anything. So, okay. um, I don't know if you guys, you guys play poker? <laughs> not very well. Not yeah. really. Okay, so, yeah. so if you've ever been trying to bluff when you're playing poker, you know how, how much you want to stay neutral and how yeah. difficult that is. Yeah. You know? um, mirroring and matching. So mirroring and matching is something that we're going to get into. Uh, it builds incredible amounts of rapport. I've got a video to show you guys from uh, illusionist Darren Brown. I don't know if you know who that is, but he practices, uh, he's a hypnotist. He practices a bit of neurolinguistic programming, although he'll tell you in all of his books that he doesn't. Um, but it's very <laughs> obvious for somebody that now does protest too much. Yeah. Um, so, uh, but it definitely is. Um, and so we'll get into some of that. And then finally, we'll go into eye accessing cues, which uh, we talked a little bit about this last <coughs> time. If somebody's thinking visually, uh, they have a certain way that they're going to, their eyes are going to track when they're trying to recall or trying to, to create mm -hmm. a visual image in their mind or a visual thought. Uh, if they're thinking auditorily, they're going, their eyes are going to go a different direction whenever they're trying to process sound, remembering the sound or creating a sound. And then uh, you've got auditory digital or internal dialogue when people are talking to themselves. Like if you were trying to recite the alphabet to yourself backwards, uh, you, that would be internal dialogue you know, that would be going on somewhere inside. And then finally our kinesthetics is whenever we feel something, whenever we're checking on the inside and it's like, man, I, I feel funny, I feel different, you know. Um, those, those are all going to have different directions that the eyes move, and if you're watching somebody and in real time you can tell they're, they're visual thinkers. Um, I can hear their words, I can tell they're using all these, oh I see what it is that you're trying to show me, that looks great, um, can I see some more visuals, that imagery is amazing, and, and if I see their eyes going all over the place in the visual, I'm like, hey, this is a visual thinker, I need to stay visual. Um, so those are, those are all things that are going to help us out a lot tonight. But those are the three pillars, and um, we can go ahead and get started now. Um, if you, have you guys had a chance to read over the first page? No. That, that's really for you. What was this? I thought, wasn't this what you said? No. Okay. No, this is new. Uh, that was from last week, and, okay. and that, that went with the YouTube video yep. um, that we had uploaded for last week. Um, this is mostly for you guys, if you want some of the background on what, what, what this is and what we're doing. Um, but go ahead and flip to page uh, four. Page four is where we'll get started. And all, these are these did not print out very well. They're black and white, so they're going to be hard to see. And some of these are pretty funny. So whenever we flip to them and you look at them, they're going to kind of make you laugh. Um, but what we're going to start with is anger. So anger, uh, this is universal. Um, some variation of this, but it's going to look mostly like that. And you're going to see it one twenty-fifth of a second most of the time because. People don't want you to know what it is they're feeling. They really don't. So eyebrows pulled down, upper upper lids pulled up, lower lids pulled up, that's underneath the eyes here. Margins of lips are rolled in, you can see that there. And the lips may be tight, kind of pursed a little bit. I don't know if you've ever seen that whenever somebody gets mad, just like, you know, that, that pursed lip thing. Um, then we'll go into fear. Fear, you got your eyebrows pulled up and together. You can see there, the upper eyelids are pulled up. You can see a lot of exposure in between the eyebrows and the eyelids there. And the mouth is stretched, normally stretched and kind of down. Okay, I was like, ugh, you know. Uh, I, I often, I have this moment that I can recall where my dog Sozo like ran out in front of a vehicle and she just does not do that. She's normally like right by my side. Uh, but there was a squirrel took off across the road and I mean she darted out and it, it was that close. And whenever I want to demonstrate this in front of people, 
that's the thought that I run through my head. I play that back, and you can see it clear as day. I'll have that, that fear that just comes on my face. And then we'll move again to disgust. Um, disgust, eyebrows pulled down. Nose is wrinkled. You get that like, almost like you're smelling something or tasting something disgusting. Um, and this can be like behavioral or food related. Like if, if something, you smell something that's disgusting, you'll look like this. Uh, but if, if you see something that you find disgusting behavior wise, you'll do this, okay? Uh, upper lip pulled up, almost like, like I say, like you're smelling something that stinks. And then the lips are kind of loose, kind of just hanging like, ugh, okay? Contempt, contempt. A lot of people have trouble with knowing what contempt is. What, whenever I say the word contempt, what do you guys think of? Like, almost like uh, something like disgust, but like more personal. Like, like disgust, personal, right? Disgust is more like gross, but contempt is more like you as an individual is what I think is disgusting. Yeah, I, yeah. I put it closer to hate. Yeah, almost like yeah. hate, right? Like, like I despise you to your core. Yeah. Yes. Like that type, yeah. So that's, that's who how you are. For who you are, yeah. what, who you are, what you are, mm -hmm. I find contemptible. I do not like it. I, I am opposed to everything you are, and I don't want to be anything like it, right? So your eyes are kind of neutral, almost just like, uh, you know. Uh, lip or <coughs> pull back on one side only. Uh, contempt is a unilateral expression. So you're only going to have it on one side of the face. Normally, whenever I do this, or whenever I see people do this, it's a little shirt at the corner of the mouth, like, Almost like, I don't know if you guys have ever heard a really bad salesman that you, that's getting on your nerves. I hope you haven't. But it's almost like that. But it's almost like that. But it's almost like that bullshit detector. Like, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, but that's contempt. I know I'm loud. I'm on the spot. I know I'm loud down the hall. <laughs> I know I'm I know I'm this loud. one's joy or happiness. Okay? Joy or happiness. Muscles around the eyes tighten. You get the eye crinkles. You know, the crow's feet. Uh, crow's feet wrinkled around the eyes. The cheeks raise. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is a zygomatic major. The muscles here, and when the zygomatic major engages, you know you can tell somebody's happy. They're joyful. And the lips of the uh, the lip corners are raised diagonal. So up, up this up in the, to the side, not stretched and down, and not stretched straight out. Okay, they're they're up stretched. So all right, sadness. Sadness, inner corners of eyebrows raised. So you see that kind of like the puppy dog eyes? You know, the eyebrows kind of come up and come together. The eyelids are loose on this. They're, they're, um, they're sad, you know, there's not a whole lot going on there. And the lip corners are pulled down, but not stretched, okay? And then finally we have surprise. This one's always fun. The entire eyebrow is pulled up, goes up really high, the eyelids are pulled up, and then the mouth hangs open, okay? The difference between this one and fear is typically you're not, you're, you're so let me show you this one again. So with fear, mm -hmm. you will almost always see a lot of white around the eyes. With surprise, you typically won't. Hmm. That's, that's the main difference that I notice in, in, in surprise and fear. Um, okay, so what we're going to do is we are going to have, all three of us are going to sit down for a minute and we're going to take turns demonstrating one of the basic human emotions and then the other two guys are going to guess. Okay? okay? We'll do that for next five, ten minutes. What you'll start to notice is that you'll get better and better the more you guess mm -hmm. at this. Mm -hmm. But what you have to do is, this, it's almost like an acting exercise. You don't want actors, you don't want them to be acting like they're happy. You want them to be happy. Mm -hmm. I gotta believe you, right? So whenever you're doing this, you have to connect with a moment in your life that actually you felt that. That's why I say I play back that moment where my dog was running out in front of the car. I play back that moment so I know it's authentic. So I, I go right back there in my mind. So whenever you're thinking about these seven basic human emotions, I want you to really think in your mind and go back there and consider that before you try to demonstrate it. That way we'll be able to connect with the real authentic emotion, okay? And you don't have to hold it, we just need to see it real real fast, and then we'll move on. All right, you guys ready? Okay, cool, we'll pause this for a second.
You guys, you guys did a great job on that. Um, so we're going to go into the next portion of this, and that, that's, that's emotional intelligence training. That's the first pillar of, of sensory acuity, is the emotional intelligence training. Getting good at reading micro expressions of others, getting really good at identifying those key uh, universal micro expression qualifiers, where it is in the eye, where it is in the mouth, where it is in the nose, and starting to really identify those. Uh, the next thing that we're going to go into is mirroring and matching, which is all about connecting to other people, okay? Mirroring and matching, we, most people like to do business with those that they know, like, trust, and value, okay? So if you act like somebody else, if you have their mannerisms, if you use some of their, their same gestures, if you breathe the way that they do, if you use their same tonality, they're going to think, whether it's true or not, this person's a lot like me. Mm. Okay, so that's why mirroring and matching is important. Uh, what do you guys think is the difference between mirroring and matching? Uh, I mean, uh, just from the thing, mirroring would be like if you're reaching with your right, I'd be reaching with my left. Okay, matching would be more like doing it exactly the same as okay. you. Okay, yeah, what do you think? I guess, yeah, to me, it's just a slight difference in the words. Right, I, I think that that's probably a, as good an analogy as I could come up with. Sure. Uh, I would assume that mirroring is very much a reflection that you're trying to almost do something at the same time, almost okay. as, a, as a guess. Yep. Um, so you're going to have the, the same reaction at the same time. Yep. Whereas matching is a somewhat of a delayed reaction. So yeah. if you just talked and did some of these types of motions, then I would follow up and say the same thing in the same way. Correct. Okay. Correct. Correct. So while while you're doing gesturing, while you're talking, anything. While you're waving, if you go to wave at somebody and they literally mirror you and wave with the same, you know, on the same side, like you said, if I wave with my right, you wave with your left, we just mirror one another, okay? But if I do like, like, what's up, man, and do like that, and you do like, oh, hey, hey, yeah. and you do like uh, off to the side, that's a match. Okay. You're matching my gesture, but you're not mirroring me directly. Okay. Okay. In my opinion, matching is far more effective than mirroring. And mirroring can come across as inauthentic if you're not amazingly good at it. Yeah. Because uh, when, when, when I see this, I think of uh, Eddie Bernard in the office. In absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. Yeah. You nailed it. Yeah. Yes. And, and everybody, when they first meet Andy, mm -hmm. they love him. Yeah. Absolutely love him. But over time, what happens? Yeah. They, so, they hate sorry him. I annoyed you with my friendship. Yes. Yeah, exactly. But, yeah. but he yeah. says yeah. every time, he's like, I'm going to dominate here. How? Mirroring, like he goes through this whole process, mm -hmm. and the thing is, it comes across as inauthentic. Yeah. So you don't want to come across as inauthentic. That's the number one sin of mirroring and matching. So mm -hmm. here are some of the things that you can mirror and match, and the same list is on uh, page eight, and that also defines the differences between mimicry, mirroring, and matching. Mm -hmm. Mimicry is the action of imitating someone or something typically in order to entertain or ridicule. Nobody likes the person that mimics them, right? That's that's whenever your three or four year old says everything you say mm -hmm. right after you, like, and after like two seconds you want to talk to. So, um, a thing that my my spouse does, this is not to like call her out or whatever, but a thing that she often does is meeting someone with an accident, an accident, an accent, or a particular like. Uh, tick or way of doing things and she ends up doing it doing the exact same way mm -hmm. would you say that that's more mirroring or yeah so so that's that's actually a natural thing that we all kind of do mm -hmm. um that would actually fall under mimicry okay um but it's not intentional and that's why this says it's typically in order to entertain or ridicule yeah. and that's not always um, but that's why i asked this. But when we mimic yeah. things people take offense to it yes however when i i lived in new zealand for a while so when I t start talking to someone from the UK or from somebody from New Zealand yeah. or anything like that, I will start to use words like, well, when I attended uni or uh, my <laughs> flatmate. And th these are not words that we would use here. So I am mirroring and matching language that they identify with and understand, but I'm not mimicking them and saying, oh, let's throw a shrimp on the bar, mate. Right? You know, right. all that, which they would hate. Mm -hmm. You know, but I, I would say something along the lines of, um, oh yeah, it was sweet ass, bro. You know, and that's not something that you would hear here, but in New Zealand that would come, go across just gangbusters. Mm -hmm. 
Um, so that's, that's the type of thing where you're not mimicking, but you can mirror and match their culture, their identity, different things like that. And people will find that flattering and respectful. Okay? Um, so, and then you got mirroring is the behavior or skill in which one person subconsciously or intentionally, some people are naturally good at this, and then some people are intentional about it. Um, the intentional ones who are really good at it are amazingly good at it. And I want you to go ahead and if you have a pen right there under section two where it says mirroring and matching, at the end of that sentence where it says what is mimicry, mirroring, and matching, I want you to circle that YouTube link so that you don't forget it. It's at the top of eight under what is mimicry, mirroring, and matching. Oh, um, I see it up here now. I was looking further I down. I was looking <laughs> further yeah, yeah. down too. No, that's okay. But the reason I want you to have that is because we're going to watch that together in a moment. Um, you're not going to want to lose that one because it, what, what, what this guy, what Darren Brown is able to do with mirroring is absolutely incredible. Um, so here are some of the things that you can mirror and match. Language, the words, gestures, and movements of someone else. Okay? You'll start to notice a whole lot more now that whenever people are talking, certain people have different ways of gesturing whenever they talk. And you'll start noticing that everybody's got their own thing. But, they, but you'll start to do it. And start to do it. Whenever you're saying back to somebody what they just said, do their mirror. Uh, one of the things that great orators and educators do is that whenever they say something that they think is important, they'll do this. And it's almost like they're giving you a nugget. Huh. Just a little bit. Or like they're, they're, they they're sure extending a gift tosses to you. Yeah, huh. extending something to you. Huh. Uh, oftentimes, whenever you, if you don't want to come across as pushy, whenever you're talking about your services and your products, uh, you can say something along the lines of, uh, you know, we've got stuff for everybody, um, but, you know, this would probably, probably fit exactly, you know, your, your needs and stuff, but. So is this kind of a bullet off, kind of a. This is, this, is, this is a very much like, you're probably fine. You probably don't need this. At the same time, though, they're starting to go, huh, he's not being pushy. He's not, he's not trying to get me, like, he's, he's giving me the, don't worry about it. No big deal. Yeah. It's not gonna, not gonna hurt my feelings. And yeah. that, that makes people I, like you. I, I see that like in the objections, right? Like, mm -hmm. why is your service not? Why can't do this? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, like yeah be it it it's, it's, it's gonna be perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's right. I, I can definitely see that. See, so, my problem is, no, it's good if you like it. Yeah. <laughs> that's that's my You're gonna want yeah. this. Yeah. So I that's, that's, nice that, that, yeah, yeah, that very, uh, yeah, people love that. Uh, that karate chop, right? Um, whenever I was doing sales training for uh, Lindsay Management and teaching people how to rent out apartments, uh, one of the things that would come up quite often, they didn't have any covered parking, no Lindsay Management park, properties had covered parking. People would always ask, you know, do you guys have covered parking? They would always go, no, we don't. And what I came in, what I came yeah. in and did, yeah, what I came in and did was I said, you know, Lindsay doesn't want to charge you extra for amenities. We want everything that we include in our, in our property prices to be, you know, already included. We don't like a bunch of upsells and things of that nature. So there's no covered parking. Completely different message. Completely different message. And, and it's same end result. Totally changed the way people felt about the problem. Yeah. So still saying no, still yeah. not, not lying, telling the truth, yeah. um, but framing it in a way that, you know, we're looking out for you and not trying to upsell you and overcharge you for things. So um, you got tonality. Tonality is all about intensity. Whenever you think about tonality, what's your tone? Okay. If somebody has a certain tone, match their tone and see if it resonates. Watch them like you more whenever they think that you're like them with your tone out. Mm -hmm. If they're a serious person with a serious tone, mirror that tone. Okay? Pitch, higher versus lower waves. People that talk higher, higher pitch. People that talk lower, lower pitch. Those are things you can match, you can mirror. Obviously, if they're a real high talker, you don't want to try matching that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to come across as super weird and inauthentic. You know? Uh, cadence. What do people in the South think about people from the North? A bunch of damn Yankees. Thank you. <laughs> do they trust people from the North? No. No, they're a bunch of fast-talking, you know, jivey guys, right? Yeah, I what what do people from the North, New York City, think about people from the South? Slow down, uh, slow uh, southerners. Un uneducated. Yeah. Yeah. Uneducated, stupid, right? So match their speed. 
Okay? That says something to them. Is it true? I'll pull up that. <laughs> is it true? It's got a lemon on I'm it. sure it is. I very have to focus on do not talk at the speed at which I would prefer. Correct. Yes. Uh, yeah. 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 And, and it's a very good rule of thumb is wait, identify their speed, and, and match it. I would say Just, voicemail is probably the hardest for me because there's no one. Absolutely. There's no one on the other end. Yeah, sure. Especially if they don't have their own recorded voice. Yes, which would be a friendly message. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Timber, the quality, the quality of how you speak. <coughs> you know, making sure that you carry out throughout an entire sentence through the end. People have a tendency to trigger on. Mm. Yeah. You want to make sure that you have timber. You have the quality. You match their quality. If they have a tendency to do that, kind of trip off the inside. Okay, do that. <laughs> so it's fine. Posture. How's their posture? How's their body position? Are their shoulders back? Chest open? Match it. Hey, good to see you. Are they facing you or are they blocking? Whenever they come out and shake hands, is it far away? Mm. Is it in tight? Match it. So they're far out, you're far out. They come inside, you come inside. Mm. Match their posture, match their body language. Breathing, pace, how, how fast are they breathing? How slowly are they breathing? Where's the location of the breath? Is it down into the belly real deep or is it up high in the chest like they're nervous? Match it and then, and then see if they'll follow you, okay? Intensity, how intensely are they breathing? Micro expressions, eyebrow, mouth, eye, and their unconscious tails. If, they do, if they're doing a lot of this, Go ahead and match it. Do, do some of that yourself. Yeah. Unconscious tells personal space, distance between, as dictated by their physiology. If they don't want you in their bubble, stay out of their bubble. If they do want you in their bubble, get in their bubble. It's fine. Match them. Physiology, the mannerisms associated with their emotional state. If they are leaning forward and engaged, very intentional as they're sitting there, lean forward and get engaged. If they're leaning back, legs crossed, kind of shoulders back and relaxed, you're the same way. Shoulders back, relaxed, just matching, matching their physiology. Emotional state, their meta model of reality. A meta model is not how it really is, it's just how I, how I perceive it. So however they're perceiving this is going, try to match it, try to mirror that, that perception, okay? And then finally, cultural generalizations, assumptions, and biases. This one is one that people get hung up on a lot, so I want to talk about it for a second. Uh, if you look down at the very bottom of this page, page eight, there's a little asterisk down there. When we mirror and match someone else's cultural or regional generalizations, we do not adopt their mindset. We embrace their mindset and align with it in order to fully understand the subject or understand the person. In no way should you violate your own morality or ethical codes in order to develop rapport, as this will be a violation of your internal meta model of who you are, mm -hmm. and you will feel like shit. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. Don't do it. All you're doing is embracing who, what they believe in order to understand things from their perspective. You are not becoming them. You're not beginning to be them. You're just embracing it momentarily to get an idea of who they are mm -hmm. and how they see the world so that have, have you actually like seen that be a problem before i mean oh yes yeah really? oh yeah. yeah 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 i've seen i've seen people become a completely different person and then when they walk away they actually lose respect from their peers huh. their peers are just like dude that was pretty slimy like we know you're like a church goer and you you know you're doing all this but whenever you were in that meeting you were like talking about getting hookers and doing blow and stuff and that's not not like like what's that about i mean when you said it it's, i've never met the guy but it reminded me of the story that seth and jeremy were talking about machine gun whatever his name was because there's no way a person who acts like that could have gotten hired that's right so clearly yeah yeah, that'd be yeah. Around. yeah so a completely different person you know so you don't want to do that while you're while you're adopting, you know their mindset, who they are. You can embrace how they think about the world, not judge them. Embrace their mentality without becoming like them. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So now we're going to uh, watch a short video. And if you guys.
You should be able to hear from there, but if you can't, you can move up. I wanted to take a member of the public who had no idea that he was being targeted and see if I could make him do something completely unexpected and out of character, possibly even break the law. This small cafe was the perfect size to find the target, rigged with hidden cameras, including a camera in my glasses. It was just a matter of time before someone came in. My idea is to use a technique called mirroring. This will enable me to have some control over their actions. The first stage of mirroring involves trying to copy the other person's body movements so that we get into sync with each other. It often takes several attempts before I find the right person. It wasn't her. <laughs> Once I'm mirroring them, I'll try to lead their actions so that they're copying my actions without being aware of it. After a while, a third person appears. After 20 minutes, I've got this guy in sync with me, so now I'm going to try and lead his actions. He's now copying me without realizing it, and I'm going to try and make him feel sleepy. Sleeper agents were used by both sides during the Cold War, the ultimate goal being to control the mind these agents in order to get them to do something illegal, which is what I'm going to attempt here. There are two things which are not going to be but you don't want to do them, so I'm sure. My paper is coffee, leave. number of electronic shops. to its right followers. I was walking up the street and I saw a, quite a nice television that I liked in that, in that shop and uh, I, I thought I'd pick it up and, and get it. I saw a man in front with a TV there and he happened to sort of be fitting with it, looking at it. Before I could ask him for help, he just had disconnected everything from the TV and he just walked out. So <clears throat> Darren Brown is a master of, of human persuasion. If you haven't seen any of his Netflix specials, I highly recommend that you go and check him out. Uh, he does all sorts of psychological tricks, illusions, different things with human behavior, which is just fascinating and will open your eyes to the world around you of how many people are just socially compliant without even thinking. Um, so a lot of these techniques 
have been derived from experts like Aaron, and that's why you've seen things online about it being uh, kind of could be underhanded, could be shady. Right. Um, but also, I want you to notice how many people did he go through before he got to one that, that it would work with? Yeah, phase three. Yeah, yeah it was phase three. Third, yeah. So if you think about those odds, 30% of the population is maybe highly susceptible. And that's actually, if you look at studies of hypnosis and things like that, uh, that's kind of the indication is that 30% are highly hypnotizable, um, whereas the rest of us just are, but not maybe highly. So, so not easily, but we all, uh, hypnosis is nothing more than that, that, that part of your brain that is aware of things that you're not consciously aware of. So like I, I often demonstrate by saying, uh, your brain is fully aware of the amount of tension that your socks are placing on your feet yeah. and, your, and your legs, but you didn't think about it until I said something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you weren't conscious of it. That's the same thing with hypnosis, all this stuff. It's, it's unconscious processing that the brain's constantly doing. Yeah. It just slides out of importance because you don't need it to survive, right? So, okay, um, anyway, so that video is that the link that I shared with you guys uh, that's on that page. I wanted to take a letter with the public who had um, so that's what I had you look at and, and write down so that you yeah. wouldn't forget it so you could watch it later. Um, any, any of his stuff that you go online and check out, those super cool. So, highly recommend it. All right, um, the last pillar. So mirroring and matching, we've gone over emotional intelligence. Uh, we've gone over, the last one is eye accessing cues. So this is a basic diagram and you can see this on page nine if uh, you're there uh, now. You've got this diagram. This is if you're looking at somebody. This is typically, not all the time, but this is typically a, a right-handed person. Okay? okay? It's not all the time, but typically. Everybody's different, though. So you have to establish a baseline with everybody. And you will get really good at this the more you practice to where you can establish a baseline rapid. Um, you saw me do this with uh, um, I can't remember. Leslie yes. last week. Uh, where I, I just basically asked her what color shirt she was wearing yesterday and immediately saw her eyes went a certain direction and I was like, I asked her a visual question. This is typically where the eyes go whenever a visual question is asked. Um, so, uh, typically uh, if the eyes go up and to the left, that is a constructed image. That means they're starting to create it. If it's up and to the right, that's usually a remembered image, <laughs> visual. Um, so oftentimes this is, is, is uh, talked about as lying. If somebody's constructing something, then they're making it up. That's not always true though. Sometimes we make stuff up without knowing no we're doing it. We're, we're filling, in, filling in the blanks. And, and sometimes whenever we're doing that, we will. We'll slide over there to making it up. And you can even see people doing that. Um, now, auditory. Normally, they're gonna look towards their ears whenever they're, they're thinking of an auditory thing, okay? So if they're remembering a sound versus if they're constructing a sound, okay? So we'll, we'll get into this more in a minute. Uh, kinesthetics, that's whenever they're checking out their feelings, they'll look kind of down, down and inside, okay? Down, down to the left. And if they're having an internal dialogue, a conversation with themselves, down into the other direction, hmm. down and inside, hmm. okay? It's almost like I'm, I'm talking to myself down on your side. And sometimes people get these mixed up, internal dialogue versus uh, checking out their feelings. Mm -hmm. That is very dangerous because internal dialogue thinkers tend to be very, very uh, analytical, very uh, facts driven. Kinesthetic people tend to be the opposite. They're very gut oriented, very intuitive. They trust their feelings, trust their emotions. So if you get those mixed up and you think somebody is kinesthetic and they're feeling things whenever they're not at all, you're going to totally miss that person and the type of thinker that they are. So you want to establish that baseline. Um, and this is when you're, when you're looking at another person. So this is the direction you, your eyes would be moving, this is the direction that you're looking at them. Okay. Um, so this is some of, the, some of the questions I ask to establish a baseline for visuals. Uh, what color shirt were you wearing yesterday? It's normally a pretty easy one. Uh, what color was your first car? Oftentimes that one I found is kind of dangerous because for whatever reason people have some sort of 
nostalgia or emotion connected with your first vehicle. And so a lot of times, whenever I'm trying to establish a baseline, if I use that one, I get an emotion, which is, is kinesthetic. So they'll actually look down and inside, mm. and they'll remember a moment with that first car. It's, it's very interesting. Um, imagine if your shirt were neon green. That's constructing a visual image. So you have to make that up, right? Um, but we actually, on this page, we're going to now, I'm going to have you guys do this with one another. Um, one of you will be person A, one of you will be person B. And what we're going to do is I'm going to have you uh, ask these questions to one another and watch the other person's eyes and just see if it is, and just draw an arrow which direction the eyes move, okay? All right. All right, Dan, are you ready? Sure. 